Professor Wale showing can lectures former governor of old Kaduna State on why a Moteko security outfit is necessary. Nigerians call on governments to intensify efforts to curb many of fake drugs. On the international scene, World Economic Forum kicks off in Davos, Switzerland. And the sport super goes to no 2022 World Cup qualifying opponents. This is ANN News. I am Olajuwoke Olatunji. There has been a heated response by Professor Wale Shoinka, the former governor of the old Kaduna State, Balarabe Musa, on the recently inaugurated Southwest Security Operation Amoteku. Musa had said over the weekend that Amoteku's establishment was a ploy by the Yorubas to create Odudua Republic. Professor Shoinka released a statement in which he said, quote, Balarabe is sadly, but I hope not tragically wrong. The Nobel laureate said Musa's statement is the type that often begins tr tragedy in nations, especially when fears are mistaken or promoted as fact. It says such could entice governments into embarking on a precipitated, irrational and irreversible act. It said tragedy can happen when there is a partial or wrong food reading of socio-political realities and history. He pointed to the acknowledgments by Southwest governors who established a Moteco that their aim was to protect their people from this escalating security crisis in their states, rather than demonize them by false attributions, which he said is the recipe for tragedy. Shoinka said other states should emulate them. If you're already salivating on the possibility of riding on the train from Lagos to Ibadan or destinations in between by April, this will burst your bubble. Minister of Transportation Rutimi Amechi says the project would not be completed by April. During an inspection tour of the rail line on Monday, the minister said the delay in completion is necessary because of the extension of the railway to the seaport. Accompanied by Oyo State Governor Sheyi Makinde, Amechi said the, governor, uh, the government and contractor will continue to work hard to complete the project and meet set targets. It said the rail line will go from the mega station in Ibute Meta to Apapa and all the way to Ibado. A large chunk of the rail line goes through Oyo states. The minister said the Itakwe Wari rail line project has been completed and is ready for commissioning. Brunei State capital of my degrees and darkness says Boko Haram insurgents have caught the city off the national grid. The transmission company of Nigeria, TCN, says the 330 kV transmission line between Maiduguri and Damaturi has been disconnected from the national grid. TCN says even the 132 kV transmission line between Damboa and Maiduguri has been disconnected from the grid for some time by the same insurgents. TCN has promised to work as quickly as possible to repair the lines and restore power to Maiduguri and surrounding areas. The terrorists have launched attacks on villages along Damaturu and Maiduguri Road in recent weeks. The United Nations recently raised the alarm that Boko Haram and Israel fighters currently mount roadblocks in the Axis. A more than 200 resident doctors at the Alex Ekweme Federal Teaching Hospital in Abakaliki, Ebony State Capital, have embarked on a three-day warning strike that has caused a partial shutdown of services and other activities in the hospital. The striking doctors say this action was necessary after an alleged refusal of the hospital management to pay all arrears of their salary shortfall. This, no doubt, is bad news for patients in need of medical attention. The action is said to have begun causing discomfort to those in need of medical services. Many say they hope hospital management and striking doctors will get together to resolve their issues to prevent more serious medical situations from erupting. Nigerians are fully aware of two standards in everything they buy, genuine and fake. Fake products dominate the market and carry much lower prices that fool many into buying them. 
And sadly, fake products pervade every sector, including medicines. And this is where even more lives are in danger. As Phil Ihaza reports, Nigerians are now calling for more government efforts to cut down on fake drugs. The circulation of fake and untested drugs on the streets of Nigeria is rising. This despite government efforts to combat a growing trend for many years. Experts say one of the major challenges in the fight against counterfeit drugs in Nigeria is the difficulty in differentiating the genuine products from the fakes. Consumers often buy fake drugs thinking they're getting the real thing. According to the World Health Organization, over 900,000 people in Africa die as a result of taking counterfeit drugs each year. With its population of nearly 200 million people, Nigeria is particularly at risk. The National Agency for Food and Drug Administration and Control, NAVDAC, destroyed fake drugs across the country worth $13 million in 2018 alone. Fake drugs are not properly manufactured. You find out they may contain uh, toxic or not so good impurities that will be harmful, can be carcinogenic, causing cancer to people that take it for other reasons. A tablet may have an overdosage of a particular item to a toxic level. So the bad effect ranges from disability to death and uh, so forth. President Muhammad Buhari closed the country's borders in August last year to curb the proliferation of counterfeit products including fake drugs. However, certified vendors in Nigeria say it's time for the government to step up its measures in regulating sales and distribution of drugs in the country. The best way to get across this problem is to control drug distribution, discourage open drug market, which is the major portal for distributing drugs in Nigeria, getting a central drug distribution system, national distribution system, state distribution, then to the province and the individual uh, shops of my school premises and hospitals can lift their drugs from the uh, province where they find themselves. For now, purchasing and verifying drugs from only accredited outlets could be the only hope for consumers in Nigeria. Coming up, African stories. Libyans hesitate to go home from Tunisia amid unstable situation. And later, international stories. World Economic Forum kicks off in divorce Switzerland. Welcome back. This is Air News. Now to African stories. Libya has have fled to neighboring Tunisia because of conflict at home or willing to return home at this time. They're not sure of safety should they return. 
Adnan Chawoche has more on their plight. Many Libyans will fear for their life, family and property. They reside in Tunisian border regions like Bingirden and Tatawin, where they have all the commodities and the guarantee of security. The situation is still unstable in some Libyan cities, especially around Tripoli. The ceasefire is only on paper but not on the ground. We are waiting for the end of the war to return home. Experts in Libyan affairs assert that the Libyans who chose to cross the border into Libya live in towns and cities where the security situation is stable. However, the majority are skeptical. The war is in Libya and is limited to some areas while the rest of the country is safe. However, the escalation could take place at any time. That is why people either do not dare to leave their towns or on the contrary to return home. Security analysts maintain that any ceasefire in Libya will not last as rival forces continue to accuse each other of breaches. The ceasefire is fragile because the main condition of the government of national accord is that after returns to its previous positions before April the 4th, that's to the west in Benghazi, but Hafter refuses to leave his current positions near Tripoli. The confrontation is imminent. In anticipation of the development of the crisis in Libya, Tunisian authorities are actively preparing for the return of Tunisians to their country. The governors of the border regions of Bingaden and Tatawin assert that the movement of Libyan trucks and civilians has resumed normally in the two directions. Many ambulances have transported Libyan casualties to the cities of Tunis, Sfax and Sous during the ceasefire. South Africa is rolling out a new initiative to clean its neighborhood of illegal guns that have been responsible for wiping out many young talents and a number of foreigners in townships where they had been viewed as intruders. The government is offering a six-month amnesty for the surrender of such legal firearms. Elisa Injimele reports from Linden, South Africa. The amnesty is part of government's plan to tackle the accumulation of firearms in South African communities and to deal decisively with the excess of illegal firearms. While it's unclear how many illegal guns there are in South Africa, lobby group Gun Free SA estimates that there are at least 4.5 legal weapons in this country and 37 of those are lost or stolen every day. The firearm amnesty period started on the 1st of December 2019. It will run until the end of May. To say that the fire amnesty period has kicked off on a good note would be understatement. In less than 50 days since the firearms amnesty period commenced, a total of 2,266 firearms have been surrendered to various police stations across all provinces. A Johannesburg arms dealer took up the call by the South African Police Service to surrender unwanted or unlicensed firearms. Chris van der Berg handed over his firearms and ammunition as he says they're outdated and have no commercial value, but still deadly. I want to pause and thank all those South Africans and Mr. van der Berg here to say this gives the dent to the crime and this gives the dent to the criminal activities out there. This is the fourth such amnesty since 1994. The South African Police Service is strengthening its capacity to recover unlawful weapons. Ballistic tests are conducted on all surrendered firearms to check if they were used in any crime. Firearms remain the enemy of our society and we as SEPs must do all in our power to protect communities from these legal, illegal acquired weapons. The declaration of this amnesty period is in the interest of the public, and I believe it will make a dent in dealing decisively with the access of illegal firearms and wanted firearms that end up in the wrong hands. The minister believes that the amnesty period is sufficient time for South Africans to hand over their illegal firearms. In a major shift in its relationship with Africa, the United Kingdom says it has signed 11 trade agreements with African countries just a few days ahead of Brexit when it will officially leave the European Union. 
At least 12 African leaders are in London for a summit aimed at boosting the UK's private sector investments on the continent. Africa is seen as an attractive market for long-term investors with many of the fastest growing economies and a rapidly expanding population with one in four of the world's population expected to come from the continent by the middle of the century. UK's Department for International Development says it is now focusing on using aid money to support investments, digital technologies, green energy and women entrepreneurs. When we return, international news, World Economic Forum kicks off in Davos, Switzerland. And later, sport. Super Eagles to know 2022 World Cup qualifying opponents. Welcome back. This is Air the News. Now to international stories. The 50th annual World Economic Forum gets underway today in Davos, Switzerland. Firm finder Klaus Kuweb said in his remarks at the opening ceremony, he is proud of the strength of the community that has gathered for this year's meeting. U.S. President Donald Trump is this year's forum headline speaker, a year after he prematurely pulled out of the gathering. Reporter Guy Henderson has more from the voice. It's like just another quiet town in the Swiss Alps. For one week, every January though, Davos is essentially taken over. A thousand or so of some of the world's biggest companies pay big bucks to set up shop in the town centre. Following them soon, some 250 political leaders, including US President Donald Trump. Security here is intense. The World Economic Forum gets underway on Tuesday for the 50th time. There are some critical questions surrounding this event almost every time it takes place. To what extent, for example, does it serve a useful purpose for the wider world? Or is it more about a narrow elite getting together to pat each other on the back and discuss ways to maintain their own wealth and power? The difference this time, of course, is that more broadly, those are the kind of questions being asked by millions of people all over the world who've hit the streets in protest. Organisers say they're listening. The truth is, if you want to get the world's leaders into a room and bang some heads together and get the messages you know, heard loud and clear and walk away with some kind of solid deliverable actions, then it's not a bad idea putting them into a small town that it's very, very hard for them to escape from. Escape they eventually will though on Friday afternoon. And we'll find out whether all the talk of action this time will be anything more than just that. The first lawyers have said at the opening of extradition hearings in Canada for their clients, Huawei Technologies Chief Financial Officer Mong Wanchohi should not be sent to the U.S. because her alleged crimes do not meet Canada's legal test for extradition. 47-year-old Mong has consistently said she's innocent and that she's fighting extradition in part because her alleged conduct was not illegal in Canada, an argument known as double criminality. Her lawyers also maintain that unlike the U.S., Canada did not have sanctions against Iran at that time. Canadian officials authorized starting the extradition process that the U.S. has charged Hmong with bank fraud and misleading HSBC holdings PLC about Huawei's technologies business in Iran. Hmong, daughter of Huawei's billionaire founder, Ren Zinfoy, arrived in court for the first phase of the trial that will last at least four days. China has repeated its call for Canada to release her. She remains free on bail in Canada and has been living in her mansion in Vancouver's exclusive Shaughnessy neighborhood. Prince Harry has arrived in Canada as he prepares for a new life away from royal duties. He's reunited with his wife, Duchess of Success, and their eight-month-old son, Archie. The Duke has said he was taking a leap of faith in stepping back as a senior royal. He said there was no other option. The duo will cease to be full-time working royals from the spring or so. They will stop using their HRH titles. They will no longer carry out royal duties or military appointments and will no longer formally represent the Queen. U.S. President Donald Trump has rejected the Democratic-led House of Representatives' impeachment charges. He has called for their immediate dismissal by the Republican-led Senate in a memo offering a legal and political case against his removal. 
There is a 116-page trial memorandum that seeks to undercut charges that the Republican president abused his power and obstructed Congress. This is Trump's first comprehensive defense before his Senate trial begins today, Tuesday. On another front, Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell has put forward rules that could lead to a quick impeachment trial with no guarantee that witnesses or new evidence would be allowed. Under the resolution, which could face a vote as early as Tuesday, Trump's lawyers could move early in the proceedings to ask senators to dismiss all charges. Under the Republican proposal, the Senate would have to vote later on whether to even allow materials collected by the House during its impeachment investigation to be admitted as part of the trial. Up next, sport. Super Eagles to no 2022 World Cup qualified opponents. Welcome back. This is ANN News in Sport. The internal crisis within the Niger Football Federation is far from over as members are sharply divided over the enforcement of the Normalization Committee on the Delta State Football Association. Niger's former international, Edema Fuluju, was elected as Delta FA chairman with former African Footballer of the Year, Victor Ekpeba, as vice chairman. But reports say there are faults within the federation trying to... Uh, the current chairman of Delta State Sports Commission, Tony Okowa, as the new DFA helmsman. Opponents of three-time African champion Super Eagles of Nigeria in the second round of the qualifiers for the Qatar 2022 FIFA World Cup will be revealed this week. The draw ceremony will take place in Cairo. 14 winners from the first round will join Africa's top-ranked 26 sides in the draw. The Super Eagles were among the teams that drew buys in the first round. The 40 teams will then be split into 10 groups of four for the second qualifying round. The 10 winners of those groups will then be drawn against each other in home and away fixtures with five victors advancing to Qatar 2022. That is ANN News this evening. Thank you for joining us. For details on these and other breaking stories, visit our website, annafrica.news. Conversation continues on our social media platforms, Twitter, Instagram and Facebook at ANN Africa TV. I am Olajimo Kyo Latunji. Have a pleasant evening.